life. <laughs> Welcome, bonjour, everyone, for another episode of Fun with Films. Joining me, my co-host Paul Gray for yet another celebration of the wonderful world of cinema. The big and small screens, that's what we're passionate about. And thank you, everyone, for joining us live or on replay. Paul, this is a very, very special recording, isn't it? Hello. Yes, yes, it is. Um, we do share our passion for everything fun with films, but today it is super, super, super special, something close to our hearts. Today we go in-depth on episode four with Eastwood. We look at the life and times and work of a true cinematic legend, Clint Eastwood. Do you know, um, this was your <coughs> idea, so credits were credits to you. After we did uh, episode one, we went to your favorite cafe restaurant in Durham, if you remember. And we were so excited because we, we had so we, much we'd fun. Actually, yeah, we'd done one episode. <laughs> we were like, yeah, top of the world. Mark. So we had so much fun and literally had pen and paper, still have it. And we were scribbling away all the different ideas. And I think I said, well, let's do some specials. And then literally without hesitation, Paul said, well, we need to do one on Clint Eastwood. And then literally... Yeah, my eyes just lit up and went, let's do that. But we had to give ourselves time because, well, I'm both excited but nervous about how on earth are we going to do justice to a career that spans literally more than five decades for 70, 70 so years. Seven, so seven decades. Um, and well, someone who celebrated his 91st birthday in May of this year. Yeah, I mean, the the worst thing in the world would be that Mr. Eastwood somehow watches this show and gives us the stare the st of doom <laughs> for doing a bad job. You know, the kind of... Yeah. Do you know? The Eastwood stare. We had to get it right. We, we won't get it right. And, and this is someone that um, all of us, me included, and people watching today, we've grown with Clint Eastwood and his work. And we're not the only one praising his work. I mean... We did research, of course, for today's show, and listen to the, in terms of accolades from the film industry, um, the recipients of four Oscars, four Golden Globes, three César, the French film industry equivalent, the American Film Institute gave him a lifetime achievement. This was followed by the Venice Film Festival with a Golden Lion for lifetime achievement. In 94, the French government given the award of Commander of the <coughs> Order of Arts and Literature in 2007, the Legion, uh, the, sorry, the Le Legion of Honor. In 2009, the Japanese government, the Emperor, gave him the Order of the Rising Sun, and so it goes on. I mean, just, wow. Um, <laughs> whether you're a fan of his movies or like him or not, nobody, nobody can dispute he's been one of the biggest influences in movies over the last... 40, 50, 60 years, but to, to be in the industry now still um, at his age, I mean, anybody in and around 50, 60 years old will turn around and say, you know, working for a living can get hard, it can get <laughs> tiring, keep an energy up. But at 91, to be able to write, produce, star in, direct, um, find the funding, um, and as we, we spoke about earlier on, even write and perform the music for some some films, to have that amount of energy and wherewithal about him, you have to give the guy absolute kudos for that. No, completely. F from uh, how you kind of observe what was going on, both uh, as um, you know, helping around, then you know, moving around to being the star of the, sort of the spaghetti western, and then thinking, yeah. I think there's a way to do this that would be more efficient, more... Uh, in line with uh, meeting you know, budget restrictions and, and deadlines and so on, let me launch my own production com um, company. Uh, Malpaso? Malpaso, which in Spanish means a bad step. Or, uh, and you know, from pretty much you know, the, the get-go, he was on the other side as well of, of the production. And to your point, during the research, I, I knew he was a fan of music, particularly jazz, blues, and, and country and western. I did not appreciate to the degree in which he was also a composer himself. Yeah. And we can see and hear, of course, some of his work on both films he's starred in, but also just directed, like Mystic River. I believe he's a talented jazz pianist, I believe. Mm. Um, in, his, in his own right, to, to the point where you know, he, he probably could make an industry or career out of, out of that, away from, from movies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of 
you got to love the guy, but you got to hate him because he's not just amazing in one thing. He's amazing in many, <laughs> you know, I'm jealous. So. He even had a stint in public service. He was a mayor of yes. Carmel by the Sea. I've been there. I've been there. Do you I've been there. You? I've been there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> I didn't see him. You know, sorry. The um. Oh, oh man, I'm so, <laughs> so, so jealous. So jealous. So, um, he had a stint as a mayor because that's what they do over there. You know, they they, they don't mind people from the arts and to, to kind of move into public life. Um, I might be able to you know a trump you on that one nah. if I may say so. If so, many, 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 many years ago, I had the pleasure of going to the Warner Brothers studio and they did the tour. So the tour is like, you know, you're into one of those gold carts and you're kind of being shown around the studios. And we stopped and we were not allowed to take pictures or film anything. In fact, I had my camera out like this, recording away um, the footage. And the, the, the guy stopped at the end of the gold cart. There was maybe six or eight of us. And he said, oh, down that road on the right is Mr. Clint Eastwood's office. And I was that close to kind of go, maybe it's worth it. Maybe I couldn't just leave yeah. now. Run. Run. Do it. Maybe get a taser <coughs> done on me, or you know, you, you can knock on the door and then Mr. Ince would open and snarls at you and then just punches you in the yeah. nose and the closes the door. Get again. that shit off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> listen, as you can see, we, we're super excited. I put just for coffee on, on the mic there. I mean, the term legend is used a lot, yeah. But on this occasion, it is merited, isn't it? Um, uh, uh, massively. I, I'm a huge fan of him in movies, and that was one of the reasons when I got the the chance on one of my trips to the US to to pop to Carmel by the Sea, just because I, I knew Eastwood was mayor there. It, it had nothing to do with anything else, but I just wanted to say I'd been there. Beautiful place, by the way. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, but one of the, on. the the laws he changed when he got in. Right, tell me. It was brilliant, best thing you could ever do, and I would, I would absolutely vote for him. He made it legal for people to eat ice cream out on the street. Well, it was illegal before. Uh, the, it, they'd kind of banned it in Carmel by the sea, and he was like, "Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. If people want to eat ice cream on the street, eat ice cream on the street. You, you got to vote for him, right? Oh, absolutely. So, listen, some of you have seen the show before. If you haven't, we have what we call segments. Yeah, we use posh words um, in terms of what we do in terms of he production. Does. We're going to start with a review of movies that you should be watching right now Ooh. online. And then we're going to move on to try to talk and talk, of course, about Crime Macho, released a few weeks ago in the UK, a, a bit earlier in the US and more. Then we're going to move on with the big question to know a bit more about your host, but still in and around the theme of Clint Eastwood. Then we're going to go into back in time. Now, for back in time, you can all take part by let's sharing on Facebook right now your favorite Eastwood movie. And then in back in time, we're just going to talk about, you know, what we've enjoyed as young men. And, and maybe women. also why it's your favorite Clint yeah. Eastwood movie. Let, let us know about why? this. And then we're going to finish with a quiz about the work and life of Monsieur Clint Eastwood. So, it is a Clint Eastwood special. Yeah, so first, um, without further ado, let's find out what The Watchmen recommend you watch with Clint Eastwood in it. Oh, I like that. You know, we should get T-shirts done with just uh, the Watchmen. Yep. So the Watchmen, what we've been watching, and we'd like you to watch two <coughs> primarily streaming services, to be fair. And we'll begin with your selection, Paul. Well, to, to my surprise, um, there isn't a lot of Clint Eastwood movies on the streaming services, correct? It's, it's hard to find a lot of his back catalogue, but... Um, you know, to be fair, that he has done so much work. So, first of all, I found this on YouTube to buy or rent, and I think you can still get this one free if you search for it on YouTube. Um, A Perfect World with Kevin mm. Costner and Clint Eastwood, which, oh, God, it's so hard, but I think this one probably goes in my top five. And it, it, it it's really a Kevin Costner movie, but Clint Eastwood is kind of... um. You know, a kind of uh, guest guest star or second fiddle in this one, but he directs it too. 
<clears throat> it's a story of Kevin Costner's character, Butch, who breaks out of jail, Butch Haynes, and um, kind of kidnaps this little child. Um, but it's, it's really a buddy-buddy movie about him and this child traveling across America in late 50s, early 60s, I think it is. So it, it's beautiful in that it's filmed with all the old cars and all the old towns, and it's still set in another time when, you know, the internet wasn't around and um, it was harder to catch criminals in those days. Um, so, yeah, it's about the relationship between Kevin Costner and I think it's probably one of his standout roles. He, he's, he's good in everything, but he's stunningly good in this, directed by Clint, obviously. Um, and the the little boy is is cool as all hell in it. Um, Philip. Is, is the character's name in this and it's really about their relationship where Butch is is reliving his childhood and getting his or some semblance of his life back having escaped from prison but he's, he's not really a good guy but he's not really outright evil either he's, he's a he's a very anti-hero flawed character but he's reliving his youth and he's he's kind of finding himself becoming a better person for being around Philip but at the same time, he's teaching Philip some lessons in life and about how to be a man, you know, a, what or 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 what he's going to be like when he's grown up. And maybe some of those lessons are not politically correct these days, but they are life lessons. And Clint Eastwood plays the Texas Ranger that's trying to hunt him down, and it's just beautiful from start to finish. And it's one of those films where you pretty much know it's not going to end well. Um for somebody, but you're captivated all the way through. What do you think? What's your memories of this movie? I went to the movies to see that, yeah, and, and you've literally have summarized exactly the same feelings of a my goodness, Clint Eastwood's character and performance, uh, the kind of the um, representing the authority figure at odds yeah. actually with um, what's happening locally with the law, and you know, it's, it's essentially the, the, the stories around the. the um, Kevin Costner characters being chased, but actually there's a there's a desire to kill the guy by the authorities. Yeah, and Clint Eastwood is having a more moderate view, and and that puts him at odds with what's happening. Now, I would agree. Uh, I've got incredibly fond memories, but also very vivid memories of the imagery of of that film, the key messages. Yeah, it's it's funny that I I asked Pascal a question at the at the beginning: it, it, what film, what one film of Eastwood's would you watch? if you only could watch one for the rest of your life, you know, every year for the rest of your life. And this is one of the ones that would come in for me. Um, I can never tire of it. It's just golden from start to finish. And the funny thing was as well, Clint Eastwood was not going to even appear in it. That's right, yeah, yeah. It was, you know, Kevin Costner talked him into appearing with it because he wanted to work with Clint Eastwood in, in that who, capacity. And, who wouldn't? Yeah, who wouldn't? Um, little... Little factoids about this one. Um, Clint Eastwood wanted Denzel Washington instead of Costner originally. Now, Interesting. Yeah, can you imagine what kind of film that would have been? Because obviously set in that time, you had much more the race element in, in the US. And it, it may have added an element to the story that didn't exist with, with Kevin Costner as well. Um, and one time, Kevin Costner, for some reason, walked off set in a huff. No, I don't know why. We don't know why. I'd love to know why if anybody does. Mm -hmm. um, and Clint Eastwood, being Clint Eastwood, um, basically got Kevin Costner standing and started filming lots of scenes with Costner standing. And then when Costner came back and was kind of like, well, what are you doing? Expecting the whole film to be shut down. Um, Eastwood said, well, I'm filming with him. And if, you do ever do that again, I'm going to film all the close-ups with him too. Of course, from that point on, Kevin Costner never missed a day's work. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how big you are, there's always somebody bigger. That's the lesson in that one. Absolutely. So my selection, I've gone into Netflix. I mean, to your point, the um, kind of filmography for Clint Eastwood is primarily rental. Interestingly, all at £3.49, which is kind of interesting uh, for, for the UK market but this is netflix in the line of fire 1993 remember going to the movies to oh, see that oh my god yeah john malkovich right john malkovich as 
the, the baddie. And now let me remind you that if this is, you know, obviously 1993, that means that Clint Eastwood is 63 by the time he's playing the character of Frank Horrigan. He directed this as well, didn't he? He didn't. He so didn't this one. on this occasion, uh, which I think it's, it's absolutely fine, I, I, I do think he likes to work with others. It was Wolfgang Peterson. Wolfgang Peterson. Known for Das Boot, the never-ending story. And uh, so, you know, someone as a director that knows about people, yeah. interaction and characters... A perfect Storm is another one that comes to mind. And, oh my goodness, it's it's just a, a great, great story, well told. So you have the character of Frank Horrigan, who is um, tortured, literally, by the fact yeah. that he was present when JFK was murdered and still feels very guilty by the fact that he could have done more and better and is now being taunted by the character John Malkovich, who says to him, I want to see you standing again next to a dead president and this is standing the over the body mouse. of another dead president <laughs> another That's you know kind of brilliant. crazy cannon mouse um, kind of story um great supporting character from Rene russo yeah and um check my notes dylan mcdermott who um yep. does always an amazing job and it's just that back and forth um there's the scene when john malkovich and clint eastwood are on the phone to each other and he's asked to keep um, John Malkovich talking so they can try and trace yeah. his position. And he's getting such an earful. And, and John Malkovich goes on, on overdrive as a maniac, which is just um, just amazing. And and it, it is a good action movie, actually. It is also a great, great story around getting older. Uh, yeah. And having still want to make a valuable contribution to, in this case, Secret Service, but in, gen in general in life as well. Well, that's the thing that, really struck me about this because at the time up until this point most action stars that were getting older would still try to do action or usually use a really bad stunt double with a bad wig which never ever sells on screen you know and this was one of the first movies where somebody so big so popular as Clint actually played a tough guy character getting old and struggling to manage. And that never really had been done before on this scale, where it, it was a case of admitting that he couldn't do what he mm. could when he was when he was younger, but he still had to find a way around the problem. And that was so brave because that could have ended his career right there and then. People could have gone, oh, he's getting too old for this. I'm not going to watch his movies anymore. Well, it was point, br brilliant. You know, the poster here is the scene where he's struggling to run next to the car, yeah. and then he's being mocked by his younger colleagues and so on. Yeah. And he's obviously, as some of them, including the character by Rene Rousseau, believe in him, also believe that he's the one to really understand John Markovic's character and get to the point where they, they're going to catch him before he kills the, the next president. But uh, I, I just once again have great memories of watching an amazing thriller, but also enjoying the fact, like you said, I'm playing. I'm gonna play a character of my age, and like I said, at this stage yep. is is 63. All right. So, what's your second selection then? It is Space Cowboys, oh, 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 which well was done. well done. What 2000? He he did this, and the thing I love about this film is switch your brain off. Not that it's a stupid film, but switch your brain off, sit down, and just have fun with it. Have fun. Um, Clint Eastwood hasn't done that many comedies. For all, he has comedy in the way he says things or maybe the things he says that sometimes the characters are politically incorrect can be deemed funny. Um, but this is, for all it's not an outright comedy, is a buddy-buddy funny film. The interaction between the icons eastwood tommy lee jones donald sutherland um james garner it's it's golden every minute they're on screen it it's just beautiful to watch these guys top of their trade as as actors and filmmakers but in again that story of are they over the hill or are they not and you know what it is it's not really that it's about that it's about people overcoming problems now, it just so happens that at his age, Clint Eastwood was in his late 60s. All of the other actors are getting older. I think Tommy Lee Jones turned 60 while he was making this. So none of them are young, young. But they had a problem to get over that age was only part of. 
It was only a factor and they had to find a way around the problem. And that's a universal topic that all of us deal with in daily lives. And um, it's, it's brilliant and it's fun. And I just love every minute of it. It's a guilty pleasure movie that I watch all the time. And it doesn't seem to get much justice and people don't seem to talk about it in Clint's back catalogue that much. But it's brilliant. I would agree. Uh, I think it's right. It's not mentioned when people talk about the, the top 10 or 20 or, or 20. In this case, of you can go... <laughs> yeah, the, the 50. Can go, can go very high. And I would say that the humanity and the warmth in that movie was exceptional. Again, I saw it at the, at the cinema on the big screen. Yeah, me too. And like me you, too. once a year, I can happily watch that with a big smile on my face. And, and just, you know, look mm. at the antics. What it, What is interesting is um, the vast majority, particularly Tommy Lee Jones, the good thing is even when they get older, they look the same. Yeah, because, yeah. He, um, he's looked 400 since yeah. he was five, you know. <laughs> I, I, I think you and I spoke many years ago when we you know, became friends and, and we knew that we had similar taste about creating a website called craggyfaces.com. Do you remember? Yeah. We, we, want, yeah. we wanted to praise the work of the likes of Tommy Lee Jones and all the other <laughs> craggy faces. <laughs> You know, I, I I think it was ahead of its time. Just before we go on that, I sure. haven't even actually explained the story. It, it's about retired test pilots and engineers. Um, Clint Eastwood plays an engineer. And essentially, long story short, is they're over-the-hill test pilots that could have gotten a chance to go into space, and they were sidelined by an unscrupulous character in the movie, and they never got their shot. And anyway, a Russian satellite that has some American technology on it starts to fall out of orbit. They need somebody to go up that understands this antiquated technology. And Clint is the guy. And the great thing, you know, a universal message. He says, I'll only do it if I can go with the other three guys in my team. Stand by your buddies. And, you know, they have got to get themselves at their age. NASA test pilot fit and ready to be able to prove they can go up and do this and it's about them overcoming that and there's a lot of hijinks involved um, a few little facts about this where are we James Garner dislocated his shoulder during filming for this so filming was actually very hard on them because it, they worked with NASA quite closely on this film um, and Donald Sutherland cracked his knee while doing it. Oh, sounds painful, right? Um, Eastwood would often film the actors because Eastwood directed this as well. Um, a lot of other directors actually turned around and said it would be too hard to direct this movie, so Eastwood stepped in and kind of proved them wrong. Um, and he would often, fil often film the actors rehearsing, and Donald Sutherland's gone on kind of record saying that he would be talking to James Garner. Ah, bah, 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 we do, yeah, this is how we do this. Blah, 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 blah. And then he go, right, when we're going, and Eastwood had filmed them rehearsing, and he's like, that's enough of that. <laughs> He'd already got the shot yeah. just in rehearsal. Yeah, he was have, very, I've very famous that, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and NASA actually helped with input on um, real astronaut procedures, including how to use the guidance system, the arsehole guidance system, when they use the loo to make sure that, hole is lined up with the hole. That's all I'll say about that. Mm. Very good. No, you are vastly underrated. And, Brilliant. Um, if as part of Watchmen, we have encourage you to go and have a look again. Then we've done our job. So I'm going to move from Netflix into Amazon Prime. And this movie will need no introduction. Unforgiven. And, yeah. and in fact, if you've not seen it, I'm going to try and share just enough so that we don't spoil the, the story. But this is the one, you know, four Oscars, one for Best Picture, which I think uh, he, Clinch, will be very, very pleased about because that's the ultimate celebration yeah. as well as Best Director. Um, Jim Hackman, Best Supporting um, Actor, and actually also got the Oscar for Best Editing mm. with uh, Joel Cox, which I think is also a credit for um, the art of filmmaking, you know, yeah. picture and and editing as much as being the best actor or the best director is always getting the, the, the spotlight. So... This is really um, Clint Eastwood's celebration of the Western genre. It is also dedicated to Sergio Leone and Don Siegel, who have had quite an influence, well, on his career, but also oh, the, yeah. on, on his style. It was his big break, wasn't it, really? And you've got to really, really watch this with this idea of, once again, 
uh, a tribute to, to to the Western genre because if you look at the framing of the shot, if you look at the storyline, which is actually perfect a three act structure mm-hmm. in terms of storytelling. Uh, yeah. Storytelling, yeah. She's got a pretty much uh, aging uh, Clint Eastwood once again, who used to be an outlaw, used to be actually probably a bounty hunter or a gun for hire, who has tried to change his life and his ways by going into farming. He's lost um, his wife. He has two young children to look after. And then, as is often the case, but this time he's not the stranger riding into town. A stranger, young lad, rides into his farm and asks him to join him to essentially claim a $1,000 bounty by essentially uh, creating a revenge story uh, from uh, the town of Big Whiskey. Big Whiskey is looked after by the sheriff, Jim Hackman, who is a brute, yeah. a sadistic brute. And essentially, the, the story is about how do you essentially, A, um, redeem yourself? How do you, um, you know, find ways to earn the $1,000 by doing wrong in an attempt to essentially at least have a future for your two young children yeah. and everything that goes with it. Of course, you know, uh, the relationship um, with um, uh, Morgan Freeman. Yeah, his friend else. Morgan yeah. Freeman yeah. in yeah. that. It, it's wonderful. Every scene them two are in together is just wonderful. So I've tried very hard to not to give too much away because, and I realise this time I'm trying to say something, I'm halfway to yeah. give away the, the story. But um, uh, once again, you know, the, the, the awards and accolades are fully justified and warranted. This is not, oh, let's let's please, you know, Clint Eastwood and let's be kind to him and award him things that because he's he's done amazing work for for the industry. Yeah, because he's this been is, around for a while. That's right. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, good. No. 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 This is talent. This is justified. Um, I mean, you've it, seen it several times, don't you? Yeah. I, I, the what I remember again, like you've seen it at the cinema, and the one thing that absolutely struck me the first time I saw this, for all. It is a Western. It's iconic. It nods back to every Western you've ever seen. It's very, very different in tone and actually goes against a lot of what you'd seen previously in Westerns. One, he is an older guy um, and he's ailing all the way through. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so the, the guy's ill. You know, he's, I, again, I don't want don't to give too much away, but. He's not the strong, superhuman, fast-draw gunslinger. He's an older guy, and he's ill, and he's kind of... You, you don't even know whether he's going to make it to the end of the film, <laughs> you know, because at times he looks like death warmed up in it. Um, so that is, is different for a start, but as well, the whole attitude of how shootouts happened and gunfights and things like that is different to what you've seen and uh, apparently very very realistic and much more realistic and the whole end scene where he walks in not going to spoil it but anybody don't want to get dead (laughs) better clear one out the back and then it starts not only is it brilliant it just is very different i hadn't seen anything in a western format done quite like that before and that's what struck me it was it was beautifully done but it was original in a genre that has been done to death mm. in fact many people went to see the movie that were not really into westerns but they'd heard so much you know the the, the word of mouth the great vine people yeah. went to see and forgiven because it heard it to be praised and they'd be the first one to say i don't really watch kaibo movies it just bores me or it's, yeah. f- it's for an older generation all oh, right well what? i think on that point actually that's something i was thinking about on the way here today is the thing about eastwood and the thing he does so well and the reason he can do a film that basically essentially the story is a one-line tagline you know, t- take for for example the mule. You know, uh, an old guy becomes a drug runner for a Mexican cartel. So essentially, the film is him driving backwards and forwards between Mexico and the U.S. And that's it. How how can you tell an interesting story about that? Well, you can because the story's very very good and the character development is excellent. Mm-hmm. And that's all you need. You don't need bangs and whizzes and explosions and CG. If you have a fantastic story, good cast, and great character development, and you understand storytelling, 
And this is literally the epitome of that. I would agree. I would agree. It's you could almost, you know, reverse it if you want to try and, and be critical and say, oh, well, it's following, you know, storytelling by the book. And I said, well, of course, because it bloody well works. <laughs> and in this case, you know, you, the hero journey will surprise you nonetheless. And I mean, to your point, just moving on quickly, there's a scene just to kind of let the audience kind of wonder what's going on here. When he finally decides to try and obviously um, earn the, the, the reward, he couldn't even get on his horse. Yeah. And 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 that's the the you know uh, saying on a minute you're Clint Eastwood not you yeah you're yeah the, the that, ultimate that rider before that the famous the famous scene I think it might be in the, in the trailer where he gets his six gun oh, yeah. and he shoots at this tin gun he can't hit it and he walks back in comes out with a shotgun boom and he's like yeah that'll do you yeah. know yeah he hasn't got it anymore but he's still got it he'll find a way around the problem and I, I love that I love that about everything he does. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to your final selection for Watchmen. Oh my God! Arguably, um, the the only film that can stand next to Unforgiven for its Oscar haul, but also um, its quality and ensemble cast. Uh, this was a film that actually didn't really appeal to me when it first came out. I, I'm not really sure why. I didn't kind of get. I want to go and see that. Um, you know, boxing films have kind of been done to death, and once you've seen Rage and Bull and, and, and Rocky, everything else kind of pales. But it was it was the fact that, you know, Hilary Swank was going to be the boxer that actually did appeal to me more so. Because at first, when I, when I first heard about this, uh, I, I thought actually Eastwood was going to be the boxer, and I didn't kind of click to what it was about. So it is about a determined young woman from a disadvantaged background, which apparently is quite close to Hilary Swank's real life um, backstory, which I never realised until I start researching this. She wants to become a pro boxer, and she has, you know, a, a, a bit of a, a, a history, but she's never really amounted to anything. And she goes to the agent boxer stroke trainer, Clint Eastwood's character, um, alongside the other trainer and help her out again, teaming up with Morgan Freeman. And she has to convince this old grizzled boxing dude that doesn't see any point in women boxing in the first place um, that she has what it takes to become a good boxer. And again, how can there's only Eastwood could take that storyline and make it into the film it is, and that's not disrespectful to any of the actors in it or females boxing. How good the film is is infinitely better if you haven't seen it than the story or the tagline. It is sublime from start to finish, and everybody in it, it's pitch perfect, absolutely pitch perfect. And the funny thing about it is the film is not what you think. It is way cleverer than you think. You think it's about boxing. You think, you know, the shock is that it's about a female going into boxing, which when this was made, there was less female boxers around. It was less known and certainly less females um, in MMA. When this came out, when was it again? 2004, you know, so it's, it's kind of early days of people starting to know that there even was such a thing. Um, but yeah, it becomes a film about a completely different subject matter, kind of at the three-quarter mark. Um, and it, it, I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen mm. it, but it becomes about euthanasia. Um, uh, it, and it, it's weird. How can those two go together? Well, just watch the damn film it, it's on the you know the, the hundred films everybody should see it, it's amazing i it was interesting because i saw this film after i would say like a break from eastwood movies it could have been just the way it was distribution and whatever so big, big gap and then i saw this i saw this film i was like oh my goodness what a story i mean literally that's what <laughs> yeah. you remember what a story and then everything else is filmed well 
there's also a bit of a guilty pleasure when Morgan Freeman teaches a young lad, you know, a few lessons as well. In um, life. Oh, you know, which is, uh, which is beautiful. Interestingly, this has um, been one of my dad's favorite movies. He responded on to on, right. on Facebook. So Jean Fintoni, my dad said that Million Dollar Baby, including British of Madison County or Sur la Route de Madison in French, are his two top, top um it's twin movies, which surprised me, but there we are. Actually, um, earlier we mentioned Unforgiven, which is also our good friend Jeff's, yeah, one of Jeff's, one of Jeff's. Um, favorite. I'm, I don't want to say any more about this film because it's, it's hey, hard, isn't you, it? Because it's you've so done good. A, you've There's done so an much amazing, to say. You've done an amazing job, but but also a bit like I was so worried about Unforgiven. If you've not seen it, then what you want to do is go in almost knowing very little yeah. and be transported by the characters, the story. And the performances, my my goodness! I mean, uh, Hilary Swank. Hilary Swank was uh, amazing, mm-hmm. absolutely. I, I, she she's good in everything, but I don't think I've ever seen her in a film a, as good. Mm-hmm. And and she's brilliant. It's just something about this film and this role and the way she plays it. It is a, you can't help but fall for the character, mm. and that's the great thing is. She erodes Clint Eastwood's character slowly. She 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 just breaks him down. She breaks him down and forces him to like her with pure tenacity and wit and fun and sweetness. And it's brilliant watching that transformation of his character from grumpy curmudgeon to put it in her hands. It's just beautiful from start to finish. Yeah. Um, uh, f- strangely, I, I think on this one, um, Eastwood wanted Morgan to play his character, but Morgan chose the Eddie Eddie character, so mm. Eastwood stepped in. But he was... The, the Oscars on this one, obviously, Hillary won Best um, Female Oscar. What did, did Morgan get his for this one? can't remember. Best picture it got again. Mm-hmm. Um, do, 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 do. Best support and actor. Yeah, Morgan got best support and actor, which uh, deservedly so. And Eastwood, best director at the age of 74. I think he was he was the oldest. Is it still the oldest? Possibly. I think it possibly, possibly is. Possibly, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. Well, once again, find, uh, as I'm listening to you, I've got all these images of the film going through, through my head. All right. Just to close on... Watchmen. We've gone from Netflix to Amazon Prime. We're going to go to BBC, BBC iPlayer <laughs> with the Iger oh sanction. God, I remember this film. So I saw that obviously at a um, very young age, uh, looking there what, what at 1975. So I was one when it came <laughs> out. <laughs> so oh I'm pretty sure I didn't see it in, in 75. I saw it you know, years and years later. Yeah. And so. We are still, you know, so this transition between the seventies and the eighties. So we still have the kind of the, um, you know, the the backdrop of the Cold War. You've got all sorts of things going on. So in this one, um, Clint Eastwood plays an art history teacher and rock climber that used to be an assassin for a U.S. secret agency, and he's called back in to do one last job by some kind of sinister character that is a cross between Blofeld and. Um, uh, something else, you know, and they're kind of bad. It's really quite sinister. Doctor Evil. Yeah, and the he refuses first, and eventually has to, to to go and go in. And the whole story is about him deciding to essentially eliminate a dangerous individual, his sanction, which is essentially the code name for assassination, and doing so by joining the, those the individual on a rock climbing expedition in Switzerland on the north face of the Eiger. That's never been done before. Very, very dangerous mm-hmm. kind of attempt. And the whole story is also that he doesn't know who within the rock climbing expedition there's four of them, who is the mark. And you've got all that going on. But before he gets to Switzerland, he has to train. Now, this is 1975. Clint Eastwood is 45. And it is monster fit. I mean, yeah. There is um, a whole sequence. In fact, um, some critics say it was too much rock climbing, not enough um, of the real story. But he spends a good proportion of the film in Monument Valley, yeah, the famous setting of so many cowboy movies. And with just a pair of jeans and T-shirts <laughs> and kind of, you know, uh, climbing boots, he, he climbs that famous needle yeah. um, that you see in Monument Valley. 
and no cheating. You can tell by the way it's filmed and so on. In fact, when you when you read about it, yeah. he did all his all. own stunt and rock climbing. Uh, obviously, he must have known about it. But because, of course, he's just wearing that pair of jeans and T-shirt, as I mentioned a moment ago, you can see his physique. And you realise this is somebody that really um, took the trouble to look after himself. And I think well, it was ju- not just for the movies, it was a conviction around um, health. and uh, Well, I mean, th- this was the early days where not many movie stars actually did their own stunts and looked the part. He was, he, you know, long before Tom Cruise and Jackie Chan and all of these guys who are famous for it now, Clint Eastwood was doing it. And he didn't have to. You know, he could have used a stuntman, could have used a body double, a stand-in, would have been safer, insurance companies would have been happier. Nope, he did He did all his own stunts on this. Um, and Phenomenal. So it's it's really one to work with two, for two reasons. The nostalgia of the 70s style of filmmaking, you know, where everything was long shot primarily, if the framing, if the story takes its time, the um, the fight scenes are quite uh, cute, shall we say, you know, for, yeah. for the days. But when you move into the rock climbing, what they had to do on occasion was to literally reinvent cameras yeah. and camera operation to be more handheld and to be more transportable and so on. So I think all, you can really um, be impressed by the production. But when you look at the rock climbing sequences, as well as the, the kind of the, the thriller and the spy story on, on the tone, this is actually a movie that has not been done like this Ever, I would yeah, reckon. And, and that's the thing, it, w- it was really done. Everything you see on film, none of it was green screen. It was them and the actor and the other stuntman on the side of a rock or on the side of a mountain and find a way to get the camera up there with them. And I, I believe one stuntman, one of the stuntmen was killed yeah, quite I early th- on, mm-hmm. second or third day of filming, where a rock fell and, and hit him and Clint Eastwood had been standing there kind of previously a few minutes before, uh, and that shows you, you know, the movie industry still can be dangerous, but for a time, you know, they chose to put themselves in a situation instead of going into a studio and using a green screen and take that risk for our entertainment. And we've got to be grateful for that, but we've also got to say that it pays off on screen. It, it, it does. You can't fake it. And if, like me, you have you know the the, the pleasure of watching it on a, on a large TV screen, that BBC um, kind of remastering in in HD, particularly when they're in the outdoors. And just as a little nod, because uh, you can all see it on on the on the poster, George Kennedy, the character that yeah. he plays, just absolutely amazing. Again, some lovely twist and turns. Again, character actor, been around yeah. forever. George Kennedy He's one of those actors that you'll go, I don't know who he is. When you see his picture, you'll go, Yeah, I've seen him in a million things. Yeah. Now, this has been a rather longer version of Watchmen, but we... It's worth it. You know, it's it's worth it. it. It's a special. <laughs> you know, we, we, we have lots to say to you. But in fairness, thank you again for sticking around, watching and dropping, if you want, your, the name and title of your favorite Clint Eastwood movie for the Back in Time segment. But for now, having walked down the corridor of posters and wonderful artwork, let's take our seat and settle to look at trailers and let's move on to trailer talk All right. right. So we announced number we kind of launched the this episode that we're going to talk about cry well, Macho. this is when we were sitting, um, having our coffee after the first episode, and what what else could we do? And I said, well, you know, we could do something like in depth with one actor, like Eastwood. Eastwood, Cry Macho is coming out mm-hmm. soon. We, we, you know, and that's how it came about, wasn't it? It was the fact that he had something coming out, which is now out. We were talking about it. We knew it was on its way, um, and then it was kind of like, oh my god, you know. 70 years in the industry. Let's talk about Eastwood. So, yeah, let's look at the trailer and see what we think. Back when we had winners, I was afraid to lose you to the competition. Five times you won the All-American. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? That was before the accident. Before the booze. You know how many people told me to just cut you loose? You gonna say anything? 
Howard, I've always thought of you as a small, weak, and gutless man. But you know, there's no reason to be rude. You owe me, Mike. You gave me your word. And that used to mean something. My son, Rafael, he's in trouble. I want to get him out of Mexico. You want me to go down there and kidnap him? Please, just get him back up here. Just you? Just me. Hey, Rafa, you can come out now. I'm a friend of the family. Touch me and I'll kick your ass, old man. Jesus Christ. Get in the back. We go and I tell you, okay? Look, the only place you're gonna go is the hospital. You get too angry. It's not good for you. You used to be strong, macho. I used to be a lot of things, but I'm not now. now I'll tell you something. This macho thing is overrated. Just people trying to be macho show that they've got grit. That's about all they end up with. It's like anything else in life, you think you got all the answers. I'm Mike. Marta. And you realize as you get older, you don't have any of them. We all have to make choices in life, kid. You have to make yours. His name is Macho. Like me. Very strong rooster. Whatever. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Yeah, I wants to name his cock Macho. <laughs> it's okay by me. He's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. That line's going to go down in history. <laughs> Any guy that wants to name his cock Macho. Uh, it shows he's still got a sense of humour. Uh, it's just um, very special that on purpose, I've not really read too much about him because I don't want no. to spoil anything. I mean, I, the, the I've not does, seen it. You haven't seen it yet. And I'm yeah. waiting uh, f- to have the time to go and see it. But for me, um, the trailer does enough to understand the story. It's actually quite a dark story. You know, somebody who eventually resorts to kidnapping, as in uh, accepts you know, a mission of kidnapping a, a young lad to make some money before essentially he ends up being completely destitute. Um and the journey, transformation for both him yeah. and the young person. And that's such a wonderful theme, you know, that comes back time and time again with the characters that he chooses to play, which is that he himself is changed and transformed by, by others around him, that is from a different background, different gender, different culture and all that stuff. You know what, what gets me about this? The first, the first time I saw it, it was like, Clint's looking old. You know what I mean? The first time you see it on there, you go, my God, he's looking old looks slow and i don't know whether he was walking slow purposely for the character but you know the guy's 91 and if if i have the amount of (laughs) wherewithal and energy he has at 91 at 71 i'll be happy but the first thing anybody that's been a clint eastwood fan and knows the macho man's man's characters that he's played is going to say is he looks old and you know what all kudos to him because it takes balls to put that on the screen and then to send the message of, you know, hyper-masculinity, the macho, you know, alpha male is not all it's cracked up to be. And this is what he was and this is what he was made famous for most of his career. And to have the balls to, to now at his age say, you know what, there's more to life than that and at some point you should grow out of it. Um, and and to show himself as old and vulnerable and slowing down takes balls. You know, most women won't even go out without their lipstick on. You know, they the, the, the won't let anybody see them, warts and all. We have lighting here to make us look better than we actually are <laughs> right now. And, and at 91, he'll go on screen and go, this is what, what you see is what you get. Yeah. And I, th- I think, you know, that should be applauded instead of going, oh, my God, he looks old and let's not take notice. We should do the exact opposite and go, 
That is amazing. Yeah. And the reason, obviously, all of you hearing Paul say that is, of course, we've come across critics, film critics, who have said the guy is too old and he's embarrassing himself and he should have not bothered. And to you all, you know what we would say, but this is a (laughs) family-friendly program, so we say nothing. And and I hate this kind of perverse ageism that goes on because, I mean, what is the message? The message is that there is a point in your life where you've got to essentially uh, literally retire and be quiet in a corner and not do uh, any work that you have passion for. But also, I would argue that this is a film about the message about the disconnect between generations. Massively. And, and, yeah. and I think that um, what we're going to see, and let me just drag and drop another picture from Warner Brothers, what we're going to see here is exactly that. You know, three generations represented by the mother, the son, and and him, where there isn't uh, uh, the, the level of dialogue and communication and exchange. And there's a scene that I know is going to bring tears to my eyes would be when they are by the the, the campfire and when they talk to each other and we're going to see uh, the the tribe elder, Clint Eastwood, sharing some life lessons that are going to be so important. And and it it is that whole thing of at one time um, that was normal. You know, children and young adolescents learned behavior and how to be and and how to be a better version of themselves from people that had learned either the hard way or from their elders um and that has kind of switched over the last 20 30 years where okay you get to kind of 50 you're on the scrap heap and you can no longer do anything and i think this is brilliant in that you see in the young boy's journey and he has his own journey through this film and his own character arc and story to tell. You see Clint Eastwood's journey, but you also see them coming together and finding common ground. And that was the same as Million Dollar Baby as well. It was that generational gap and gender gap with Hilary Swank and Clint, and they came together and found respect for each other and common ground. And if nothing else... That is an important message in today's disposable culture. Absolutely. I just put a shot on screen for all of us. Rogers, if you're listening on the podcast, but um, I'm sure, you know, the director of photography and the filmmakers were, oh, this is this is a shot that we want to yeah. capture. Uh, absolutely. There's many reasons why we should be excited about this film. A, yet another wonderful contribution by Clint Eastwood and, and all the messages that um, we thought. Interestingly, this is based on the 1975 novel, mm. and I didn't pick it up from, from the trailer, but actually when you read just enough, this takes place in 1979. Yeah. So we're going to get some lovely kind of nostalgia in and around the you know the fashion, cars, and music yeah. and that kind of things. But many reason to be excited. The um, editor that helped him win the award for Unforgiven is back on Joel Cox, um, helmed by the director of photography Ben Davis, who's also worked on three billboards outside Ebbing. So I think we can expect right. some amazing okay. filmography. Um, and in terms of the score, uh, we believe that Clint Eastwood had. A bit of a contribution, inclu- including a composer that we don't hear uh, often enough, I think, Nick Mancina, who does some amazing, amazing work. So, yeah, many, many reasons to be excited about um, Crime Night Show. Yeah, this this film apparently as well has been in development hell since 1991 um, until Clint Eastwood in his own kind of fashion kind of said, well, I want to do this, and then bang, makes it happen. He, he, you know, he's Clint Eastwood. Um <laughs> But as well, originally attached was Roy Scheider from Jaws. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger wow. was attached to this project at one point, um, and, and they both fell through. Um, and kind of, I would have liked to have seen what Arnold would have done with, would have done with that, mm. even though, no, you know, Clint is, is amazing. So a lot of people are excited, including people from the film industry. I've got something very special for you. <laughs> And for you, viewers and listeners, whether you're watching or, or listening, Warner Brothers, uh, in addition to the trailers, everything else that would, would qualify as a promotional pack, did a mini documentary about Clint Eastwood and this movie. And we're going to watch it together. Oh, wow. Clint Eastwood is the essence of the American hero of all the things we think we all are and would like to be. Look 
at the pantheon of American filmmakers. Clint is right there. And we all recognize Clint as this national icon. He manages to hit this kind of nerve that the country understands. He's sort of in touch with the heartland. He's been doing it for so long that he's come to a place where he just trusts his instincts. Get in the back. We go in and tell you, okay? Look, the only place you're gonna go is the hospital. You get too angry. It's not good for you. When we were looking for projects last year, Clint said, you know, there's a script, Cry Macho, that I already had. I, I, I want to take a look at it. Clint plays this rancher, a character that you know is kind of that old Eastwood type of thing, what a real cowboy is supposed to be like. You used to be strong, macho. I used to be a lot of things, but I'm not now. The thing that everybody loves to see is Clint in a cowboy hat and on a horse. He hasn't been on a horse since Unforgiven. Let's see if we're the, the right leg like. The first day that we filmed the scene of him up on the horse, the crew, on my, they were just like all so excited. It was a special moment. He's back in the saddle again. There's also sparks for a relationship with a woman in his life again. I'm Mike. Marta. It's very touching, and it gives you all of those great iconic moments that you've seen in Eastwood films. You want him to go and ride his horse off into the sunset. to make choices in life, kid. You have to make yours. So there it is. Wow. I thought it'd be a lovely surprise. Thank you to Warner Brothers for publishing this, allowing people to watch it on YouTube and around the world. I'm going to ask you a question and I feel almost welling up when I'm asking these questions. Do you think this is Eastwood's last film? God, I hope not. Um, no. Do you mean as an actor or a director or altogether? Altogether. Alt yeah. uh, no. I, I would think, even if he if he if he steps back from acting, I think he he likes to keep himself busy, and I think he probably do directing or even producing projects. But that being said, if it is, what a way to go out. Mm. Well, let us know. Um, I'm, I'm guessing for all of you watching and listening, you want to see more work coming out of this mind's kind of uh, genius. So, Cry Macho, just, I'm so excited, honestly. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's move on to it's a fun, fun segment called The Big Question, which actually has a bit of a Western theme when we, we play for you Do -do -do -do. The Sting. <laughs> Whose oh, turn is it to go first? Um, I don't know. We, I haven't, don't got know. The, we haven't got the dice. We, no. we can't roll the d20. So um, I'm going to say you're, you're the guest, so you're going to go first. So this is your chance for you to discover more about your host of Fun With Films, where we ask each other uh, each time we do a recording a big question. I've got actually two or two parts. So I'll go one, we'll go up to you, and I'll go back to the other. So the first one is if... You had to live your life really as one of Clint Eastwood's characters. So for the sake of argument, your life was the cry macho character. You had that was your life. You had to live that. Mm. Which of Clint Eastwood's iconic characters would you live as and be? Which would one be? Oh this is this is a tough one, but I'm going to say, oddly, the, 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 the character that I um, probably would relate to the most, you know, when I think about him and I think, yeah, th that, that's me, it would be um, Blondie in The Good, Bad and the Ugly. Ah, right. Yeah. 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 Whereby, despite the fact that, you know, he's, he's on, you know, on the side of being an outlaw, he's got strong values mm -hmm. and actually is... Um, 
you know, reliable in, in some ways, super smart. And of he course, is very clever. That's yeah. one thing about those films. The character mm. is so, so clever. And love is, you know, kind of dark sense of humor and the one, the delivery and so on. Because I think the, the other character, which is, you know, what we talked about, actually, you only need three, you always need three characters for the story yeah. to come alive. The, the, the other two represent different uh, psyches, actually, it's different kind of ways in which you can go. And on one hand, you've got, you know, the one that is silent, deadly, like a snake. And you've got the other one, which is like the ultimate extrovert that can yeah. never shut up and get himself into all sorts of trouble. So, um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, Blondie from The Good, The Bad, so and you, The Ugly. You had to live in, you would have to live in the Western era, yeah. live that life. And eat beans. Yeah. Wear a stinky, dirty poncho <laughs> that apparently Clint Eastwood still has really? and, and has never been washed wow. because he was scared it would fall apart. So, yeah. That's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, come on. Okay, Hit so me. my question is, I want you to imagine a, a situation whereby you are riding your bike. What bike have you got again? My motorbike. My, yes. I've got a Moto Guzzi V7, the Italian Harley Davidson. Okay, so you and a few friends are riding down Route 66. <gasps> bucket list, bucket list. I'm following um, behind with the camera because I'm here to document everything. We stop somewhere for, for the evening and we are at a local bar, would be you know the term, I suspect, or saloon. Things are moved on and it kicks off. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's not your fault. Paul is a, is a well brought, a very polite it's, man, but yeah. something happens. Uh, I can't help because I'm behind the camera having to document everything. So walks in someone that can help you, but you need to decide who's going to help you. Which Clint Eastwood is going to help you? Would it be Inspector Harry Callahan, Dirty Harry? Would it be Marine Gunnery Surgeon Tom Highway? Or would it be the preacher from Pell Rider? Who's going to be right. with you to take Easy. on? Easy. Easy. Gunnery Sergeant Thomas Highway. <laughs> Easy. One of my favorite, is favorite, is favorite is Clint Eastwood films. Definitely yeah. in the top five. And one of my favorite characters. It's a bar fight. Yes, it is. We're in. Actually, oh, he's not on there, but the only one that would top Tom Highway is Philo Bedo from Any Way Which But Loose. And he Fair deals enough. with biker gangs all the time in those films, <laughs> right? Yes. So, anyway, but we take that aside. Tom Highway, um, it's a bar fight. There's going to be knives. There might be a gun, but majority of it's going to be hand to hand chairs and tables and stools being thrown around and we just go back to the scene in in Heartbreak Ridge Gunnery yeah. Sergeant Tom Highway faces off against the Swede mm. Swede, 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 Swede the iconic scene um, played by is it Brock Brock Reson uh, Brock, Brock Lesnar is it um, the MMA fighter and um, just Mountain of a guy and Tom Highway just Clint Eastwood just takes him out hard, fast, puts him on the floor, and then scowls down <laughs> at him with the, the best line Why don't you lie down there and bleed for a while before you taste some real pain? That's a guy you want backing you up, right? I mean, I would love to tell him that. Uh, Approaches again, I can't help. I'm behind the camera. <laughs> but uh, I think if you've got Tom Highway on your side and um, people be telling the story for years to come in that bar. Yeah, I'd, it would have to be. Um, <laughs> I, I love them all. I mean, Harry, Dirty Harry's amazing. So, was, you know, um, his Western characters and what have you. But Tom Highway was just fantastic. And, and he's the, the fisty cuffs guy. Is all right. So, what is the second half of your oh, question? Second, second half. Right. If we could take Clint Eastwood at any time in his life, mm -hmm. any any film, any era of his life, pull him out of that time and put him in any film role. So, to to make sense of that, if you were thinking that Stallone around the time of Rambo 3, would have been great in place of Jason Statham in The Mechanic. Mm. You know, that that's the mm -hmm. kind of the vibe we're going at. So any, any iconic film role like Pacino in Scarface, where we think Clint Eastwood, at Pale Rider time, would have done that brilliantly. What do we think? Do you know... 
what, what is fascinating is that I've realized through the research that Clint Eastwood has never made a sci-fi movie, as in pure sci-fi, right. or even horror. He's never done that, which is kind of Excellent. fascinating. We mentioned a moment ago, actually, about um, you know Schwarzenegger being considered for one of his roles. So imagine, you know, just for a moment, we have a situation where we are seeing a version of Predator with Clint Eastwood right. as Dutch. Nice. Or even, can you imagine Eastwood as the Terminator? Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah I've yeah. just thought of that. That'd be but, cool. Um, Predator. You know, so I think that would be one that would be absolutely fascinating to um, to kind of do. But I it, would say... It would be good to the chopper. <laughs> <laughs> if it would be, you know, very, very different. But if you keep all the other yeah. the same actors, but that's him playing, playing the role, I, I think that would be... Very, so very interesting. Which Eastwood? Which era? Eastwood. Oh, I'm, I'm talking. Um, you know, this How one, old? I'm talking. Um, you know, Tom Highway again. I'm talking. Yeah, Har- sort of Harbreck Ridge. Fifties. Sixties by then. Was he? Was yeah. he that old then? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. He was, yeah. yeah. And I mean, he still looked about forty. Mm. You know. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that would be. Um, yeah. He could pull it off. Pull it off. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Mine um, for that one is. It has to be if you imagine when Stallone made Judge Dredd with Danny Cannon mm-hmm. and kind of spoiled the film by making it too buddy buddy and Danny Cannon wanted to to make it much darker and much gritty and much like the subject matter. Can you imagine pulling Clint Eastwood at the Tom Highway Heartbreak Ridge age with that you know jawline? And putting them in Judge Dredd's helmet and the mask, where you just see the craggy kind of jawline mm. and the voice, and you know you got the scowl. And blah, blah. I think he would have made an amazing Judge Dredd. Yeah, again, sci-fi. Yeah, because yes, he strange, hasn't yeah, done yeah. it. Because you feel like he's done everything. You know, the one that he's not done is in the round cars. You know, imagine the. Um, yes, he has the rookie. Was about car theft. Car theft. Yeah, room. but I'm talking about him literally being the driver of mm. fast cars, right? Alarm, you know, bullet or stuff like that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been in cars, but uh, I think he's not. Yeah, really not really great. car chase yeah. orientated. Yeah, yeah. So Fast and the Furious with Jack, Jack Richer, an old Jack Richer. Yeah, Fast or, f- or instead of Dom in Fast and the Furious, mm. head of the family, as it were. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so what? On that note, please. Comment, what would you like to see Clint Eastwood? Um, what role would you like to see him take? Yeah, you've got the time machine. You can transport him you know, into the future, literally, for him. Yeah. And he's a star of a well-known movie. And talking about time machines, now... Oh, what a segue. It's time for Back in Time. All right, so in Back in Time, one of my favorite segments, actually, we yes. just talk about, um, in this case, with the Clint Eastwood special, the very first few films you may have seen as a very you know, young lad. And your selection is outstanding, young sir. Thank you. First one up for me was one of the earliest oh, films, oh, oh, The oh. Gauntlet. And it's one of those ones that a lot of people haven't actually seen. Um it was one of his six movies with his ex-wife, Sandra Locke. Mm-hmm. And essentially, it's a bit of a road movie where he's a cop, Ben Shockley, and he has to take this prostitute from A to B to testify against the mob. And the mob put a hit on her, but some of the police are in on it, so the police can't be trusted, and they're trying to kill these two as well. And the one thing... um I loved about this was it was around the Dirty Harry era, but the cop he plays is not Dirty Harry. He's a bit of a loser. He's an alcoholic. He's not the best cop. He's a bit of a joke on the force. And again, that was such a bold and brave move to to cast himself against type and, and make this movie. And it's brilliant. It's It's... A little shorter on story, but higher on action. And when it was made, it was one of the most expensive effects movies ever made because they really built a house, drilled 7,000 holes in this house, filled them full of explosive squibs, and then kind of shot the house to bits till it collapsed like a termite mound. 
And it cost like two hundred fifty thousand dollars at the time, and this is what nineteen seventy seven. This yeah, film, yeah, seven, yeah, yeah. Um, and they did the same with the bus at the end, and just oh, shot it scene. to pieces. And it's just brilliant. It, it's still a cool action film, and it kind of goes under a lot of people's radar. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing that. And can I just mention quickly for those of you watching the video version, the artwork on that. Poster, Paul. I want this. I had I that. Want... I had that poster. You had it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this would be beautifully framed. It almost feels like a Frazetta type things. You know, if you think about it. Um, brilliant, brilliant choice. Just a cool point on that. The uh, it it's it's remade as sixteen blocks with Bruce Willis. Ah, it was the influence yeah, for yeah, sixteen yeah. blocks, which in and of itself is a fantastic little movie as well, where. Bruce Willis went against type mm. and plays a bit of a loser cop that has to kind of right, step yeah, up. Yeah. But yeah, that was a remake of The Gauntlet. Fantastic. Well, mine was the, the very, very first movie that I saw. Um, my dad took me to the movies yeah. to go and see the Again, good, look at the, artwork. the bad, and the ugly. Or oh, just on purpose, I chose the Italian poster, El Buono, El Bruto, El Cattivo. And... I was so young that when I sat on the the, the seat in this kind of uh, plush cinema, I couldn't see anything, so I had to sit on the armrest <laughs> to be able to see anything. And I remember being captivated. I think that the, the story was too complicated for me, but I remember vividly the scene where, at the beginning, the character that plays, obviously, the, um, you know, the, the, the bad uh, captures Blondie. And drags him around the desert, remember? And, and yeah, it's, kind of it's been this, a long time uh, since I've seen it. So I remember... Thinking, this one's Blondie, yes. Yeah, Clint yeah. Eastwood's Blondie. Clint Blondie, yeah. And he's been kind of, uh, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's got his hand tied, he's walking in the desert. The other guy is on a horse with an umbrella and drinking water and speaking yeah. of water and torturing him. And I thought that was so mean. I was, <laughs> I was probably about six or seven when I saw this film. And that stayed with me. Dad, he's been mean. But um, it, it's a masterpiece. Uh, Sergio Leone, yeah. Ennio Morricone's music, the um, ecstasy of gold at the end with the, with the three way kind of um, shootout. Lee Van Cleef had, Lee is that Van the Cleef. one where he had the gun with the, the little kind of handle mm, thing on it? Yeah. yeah. And, Which um, was brilliant. Uh, I mean, Sergio Leone doing a frame, fr uh, fr um, fr framing, um, sorry, frame phrasing. He's doing slow motion. He's doing um, extreme close-up. He's doing all sorts of things yeah. that really uh, change, um, you know, cinema for, a forever. Again, Westerns hadn't been done this way. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and lovely memory of sharing this with, with my dad as well, which is lovely. The, the sound mm. of the, the bullets yeah. in, in these films, the three, the three films, didn't sound like any other mm. but have been used so many times since these films have become like an iconic western bullet sound um but these were remakes of the kurosawa that's right um classics all right your next selection for um oh my god time. yeah this this <laughs> oh my <laughs> earliest <laughs> memories of clint eastwood films were Anywhere Which But Loose and Anywhere Which You Can, the yeah. two films he did a, a few years apart. The first one was 78, the second one was 80. And bear in mind, I was a kid. In 1980, I was six years old, and I used to just watch these films. And Clint Eastwood hasn't done that many outright comedies to the point when he made these films um, that were originally uh, slated for Burt Reynolds. Mm. And Reynolds had done Smokey and the Bandit and what have you, and... Clint got the roles and he, he didn't really know how to approach it. So I believe he phoned Burt Reynolds and asked some advice. And he is genuinely funny in this, but the whole stories are absurd. It's <laughs> it's absurd, you know, that uh, again, Sandra Locke in it. And you've got Clint Eastwood, who's a truck driver by day and he's a bare knuckle prize fighter by night. And in the first one, he has to fight um, Tank at the end, uh, anyway, which put loose. And Tank was a real life bare knuckle mm. prize fighter, apparently. The, the actor that played him, I think, um, Walter Barnes, been in a lot of films, always played, you know, the, the, the brute or the bad guy, but was a real life bare knuckle boxer. And in his adventures, his best friend is the orangutan, yes, right. Clyde, Clyde, you know, and it was just mental. This guy's riding around in the truck with this huge orangutan, um, and it captivated me when I was a kid. And one of the things Eastwood has said is that the most gifted actor he's ever worked with was Clyde. <laughs> but you yeah. had to get him on the first take yeah. because he had a, a very short attention span. 
And, it, you know, that famous, 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 famous line of right turn Clyde that yeah. I still find myself saying today, you know, if somebody's getting on your nerves, is it's kind of right turn Clyde. And the the wrong turn, bang. You know, punch right. And if you're on the right, you get a, you, you get a monkey punch straight in the kisser. And it's just so, it's silly, but it's so funny. And I adored it when I was a kid. And the second one, anyway, which you can, uses the, the, the biker gang. Yeah, yeah, and that 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 had me in kinks, and I still laugh about it today. So you've got this biker gang with John Quaid as the main head biker, the Black Widders, and they want to be bad so bad, but they're not. They're mm. they're really really bad at being bad, and every time they try to 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 get Philo Bed or something goes wrong, so they chase them on their bikes. He turns left in his truck. They go straight ahead through this tar that's dripping down and they all come out the other side and it's <laughs> stiffening up in the tar and they fall over and it's like, I hate you, Philo Beto. And then he comes out with a line, well, we got to move them because we can't leave them there for the dogs to piss on. It ain't fair on the dogs. And obviously he takes them to hospital and they have to get this. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, so I remember. Yeah. The tar stripped off them so they have no hair at all. They're <laughs> all bald and then they, they end up with this great scene where this biker gang's fighting over the best wig. Yeah. I want the red wig, you know, it matches my eyes. And they've they got painted on eyebrows. And then they get pulled over by the police. The police it, yeah. It's mm. just so funny. It's politically incorrect as all hell. You know, it, it's a seventies movie, but they are so so funny. I, they, they I are love interestingly them. chosen by Denis Fintoni as her top Clint Eastwood movies as well. I'm sure because of Clyde, but also the wonderful Jeff, Jeffrey Lewis, who yeah. once again, uh, you know, everything. He William does, Smith in the in the second uh, one as well. Right, yeah, Great yeah. support and cast, I think, as well. Um, for these. Because he's a he's a prize fighter, and we haven't really talked about that. Some great gritty bare knuckle mm -hmm. fights, and the one with William Smith, he was trained by Al Silvani, who trained Jake LaMotta and Stallone for Rocky. There you go. And once again, the artwork back in the, in those days uh, outstanding. So my second choice for back in time is, as mentioned a moment ago, Heart oh, Break Rage. So the story is that my brother Yannick had gone to sit first um, in Bordeaux. So where we, we should leave outside of Bordeaux and go into the big city to go to the movies was always a, a, a big kind of adventure on the bus. And he came back from a, a, a day away in Bordeaux. I've been seeing the film so excited and so happy. And he was telling me the stories and he was laughing and he gave me the anecdotes and so on. So... I had to go and see this film because that looked a both an amazing comedy, but also the action. And but he kept telling me you, you, the 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 lines of Clint Eastwood, but also the way he looks at them and the way he kind of treats obviously the the young army recruits and so on is hysterical. And the final fact at the end is still to this day yeah. absolutely outstanding. And so, it's a real conflict in um, Grenada that not a lot of people know happened, a U.S. conflict that was kind of over before it started. Yeah. But, yeah, it was a, a real campaign. So, you know, that's 1986, so that's exactly when we signed to have our own pocket money and could go into the movies uh, ourselves. So that puts in at, obviously, at the um, grand age of 56. Yeah, yeah, and I, I thought he was mid-50s. The thing about, I love about this film as well, Clint Eastwood being brave, mm. again, he is the ultimate alpha male in this, but he was 50, 55, 56, you know, getting on where physically he didn't look it, but in his head, he's starting to think, as a as a as an actor and a director, he's going to be honest, mm. and he he puts himself out there in that his character is an alpha male. He's a he's a marine. He's training marines how to be killers, but he's crap at relationships ships with women. He, right, he's yeah. poor at it. So his whole character spends his time reading women's magazines to <laughs> learn how to relate to women. And again, it's ballsy. It's brave to put that on screen. You know, so many actors want to be perfect at everything in their film. And it's nice that he, he kind of put on screen that, you know, maybe we don't know everything, even if we're the tough guy, the alpha yeah, male yeah, or, yeah. Or, or the boss that, you know, 
I still need to be better at something. And I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Because all, all the female characters are always there to kind of be, be that kind of uh, mirror of, you know, some of the shortcomings and so on. Also for me, yeah. I discovered Mario Van Peebles through this film. Mario Van Peebles yeah, was amazing. Plays, plays a wonderful, wonderful role. Just got um, another contribution on, on Facebook from Denis Fintoni saying the addition to Any Which Way But Loose, um, Where Eagles Dare. Yes. Is one of her Fantastic. top Fantastic. Um, what were we saying? Mario Van Peebles? Yeah, one of my favourite movies of him was Posse. Yeah. Again, a Western, right. Western yeah, movie yeah, highlighting, right. um, you know, black cowboys because, you know, for a long time people didn't realise one in four cowboys were, was, was coloured. This is your final selection for Brilliant. Back in Time. It's yeah, cool. it's kind of like all Dirty Harry films, yeah. you know what I mean? It's all Dirty Harry films, as you know, all five of them. But the thing with the Deadpool, it was done in 1988. Um, the other, uh, at that age, the other um, Dirty Harry films I had seen but already felt a little bit old. They were a little bit more like my dad's movies. Mm-hmm. And there was a gap between the fourth one and the fifth one came out when I was really getting into movies and into action movies. And it felt like the first film (laughs) and the first, you know, dirty Harry film that Clint made for me. And that's how I remember feeling when I saw it. It was fresh and new at the time and it had a different vibe to the other. It was kind of not so dirty Harry. Because yeah, yeah. he was again Harry Callahan's getting older, the 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 the, the enforcer, the, you know, the sudden impact, dirty Harry put the gun in your face and do you feel lucky, punk? Was getting a bit older and was having to move with the times and change. Um, but again, you know, just brilliant performances, a great story where Harry is put on a list of famous people and those people start to die. And is he going to be next? Mm. And who's the killer? So it had a kind of a a thriller, murder, mystery side to it. Um, and Jim Carrey's first acting gig, where he plays the rock star Johnny Squares, who basically is the first one mm. um, on the list. And, you know, a great little part. And if you've ever seen the, the YouTube clip of, of Jim Carrey talking about how he got this role, and how he prepared and ad-libbed and went for two hours um, performing parts for this role and then literally it's cut down to like one line and him dying <laughs> is just brilliant. Talking to Jimmy Carrey, have you seen on YouTube when he does an impression or can just... Yeah, it, where that's, literally that's on that. literally his face. And, it's, and it's on that scene oh. where he's actually, it, it must be an awards ceremony <laughs> with Clint Eastwood and he's standing there talking about this and... Um, when he did the audition tape, he auditioned singing Alice Cooper songs, but I believe he sang uh, a Vegas Elvis rendition as well that cracked Clint Eastwood up. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't appropriate to do that for this Dirty Harry film. He had to be kind of a rock star, and uh, like you know, um, there's appearances by Guns N' Roses and Slash in it, so he was that kind of rock star. But later in Pink Cadillac, he's doing the Elvis impersonation and. You know, Clint brought him back because he was so funny doing it um, in his audition for for Dirty Harry. Um, yeah, uh, Liam Neeson yeah, that's is right. in it as well, an early part of Liam Neeson playing a British film director. And it, it's just wonderful from start to finish. It's a great, um, great movie. You're right. It's also one where the, the character, it, it feels slightly... Um, now out of step with the 80s with this idea of fame this idea of a list a game that people actually are betting on it's thinking what is happening to the world and, and i think that that's just wonderful okay my contribution final one for back in time this is one that as a family we've enjoyed so many i times. love this movie kelly's heroes um ian that comes to my gym i think this is one of his favorite <laughs> movies as well and my memory is particularly my mother laughing so much with the antics, particularly of Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland. There, with his um, you know, negative vibes, lines, and that kind of things. What um, about his dog impressions? <laughs> you want to see my dog impression? Bark, 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 bark. And <laughs> so I, I'm assuming everybody knows about Kelly's Heroes, but if you don't, this it's, is obviously it's a bunch of hapless um, kind of U.S. Army uh, generals and commanders and all sorts who want to rob a bank in France, if I'm not mistaken. 
and well <laughs> you you've got to um to, to watch it to really uh, understand everything that that goes on and every attempt is swought by something that's, that's yeah. under their control uh, including germans of course and um for you to dis- to watch and discover whether or not they do get to get their hands on the gold inside the French bank. Donald Sutherland steals the show in mm. this whole movie. Right, I mean, he's called Oddball in it, and I don't know whether he coined the phrase Oddball, whether whether he was called Oddball because he was an oddball and the word already existed, or whether his character Oddball has coined the term you are an oddball, but he just is. He's mad as a fish and funny <laughs> all the way through it. He's so, just wonderful. As some of you can see on the post, you've got Telly um, Savalas, you've got Don yeah. Rickles, you've got Carl O'Connor. And what I will say is that I reckon they, they didn't try hard to say, this is what I would do if I was in the army. Uh, I think Donald said, I would be you know, the, the guy that basically doesn't want to fight really <laughs> yeah. and just piss about and, and uh, <laughs> try and, and make it as enjoyable as possible, you know, and... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I, I remember being absolutely in fits of laughter with, like, you know, do you want to see my other dog impression? Woof, 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 woof. <laughs> woof, woof, woof. And he's cheap, kind of. Woof, 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 woof. And it, the way he does it, he has this wry little smile on his face where it, it's just wonderful. It, I, yeah. As a kid, I loved that film, and my so, dad did too. Yeah, yeah. So, th- this for me, the memory is a family moment where. Everybody's laughing in the living room yeah. watching this and uh, thinking, yeah, well, why wouldn't you do that? So that's taking us back to 1970, wow. though, which is um, quite quite something. <laughs> just, just very quickly, before we move on to Sandy, the final segment of Fun with Films, you mentioned a moment ago about people working with um, Clint Eastwood. And I remember vividly that interview of Tom Hanks. Yeah. Working with Clint Eastwood. It's... And it's just so funny. I mean, we... we... One thing he's famous for, Clint Eastwood, as a as a director and a filmmaker, is getting through films quick. Um, I think Million Dollar Baby was filmed in thirty five days, which is just phenomenal. I mean, it's an Oscar winning film. It's a, it's an amazing film. Everybody critics, everybody loves it. It was filmed in thirty five days, and that was four days earlier than than scheduled. And it, it just doesn't happen. He's so clever with his casting and how he frames the setup and the camera and how he manages his time. He, he does 30 to 40 kind of scenes per day, which is unheard of. But at the same time, because of that, he very rarely does second takes. And that's part of the reason why. So he expects you to do it right on the first shot. Um, and Tom Hanks talks about this and it's brilliantly led in by Graham Norton saying, okay, you know, Tom Hanks, um, you're so famous, most people would get nervous working with you. And and Tom's very self-depreciating and is kind of like, oh, yeah, if only. And he says, well, you know, the, the tables were turned when you worked with Clint Eastwood, right? And, you know, Tom Hanks apparently was absolutely nervous all the way through the making of Sully because he didn't want one of those Clint Eastwood stares. <laughs> You know, the eyebrow and things. Do you want to tell the rest of the story? Or? Well, so, you know, Tom Hanks is used to working with many uh, directors. He himself has been on the other side as producers and is waiting to hear the kind of action or words to that effect. And and he, he hears nothing. And though he's just then going through the scene thinking at some stage, the director Clint Eastwood will, will tell me to kind of uh, get on with the scene, and eventually, nervously, he kind of looks up, and um, Clint Eastwood just goes, "Yeah, that'll do." <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom Hanks kind of tells that he um, he treats his actors like horses. And something he learned on Rawhide mm. is all of the old directors used to go, ride, set up, camera, action, go. And the horses would, you know, get startled and rear up and run away. And, um, you know, they would have to set the whole thing up again. So Clint quickly figured out, you know, to, to, to do it quietly. So he treats his actors that way. And I think, you know, it, it would kind of relax you instead of, you know, get people getting nervous action go and then you you know you, mm. you're in the moment so his his term is um all right go ahead <laughs> and and that's how it, that's that's instead of action and to finish it that's enough of that 
if he's got what he wants or as Tom Hanks puts it, stop if he wants you to do it again, which is very, very rare. But and, yeah, and it's a wonderful story. And Tom Hanks tells well. the story of normally what happens, you've got the the action or whatever, if, and then you have the praise at the end where the scene and the doubt is happy. That's enough of that. You don't get and you that. you move on. <laughs> Tom Hanks all, thank you, Mr. Eastwood. <laughs> And I'm sure there's many actors that could, you know, tell you stories like this. But um, yeah, he's he's just himself. He's, he's a legend. He's a legend, and uh, you'll take it. Okay, so thank you so much for <laughs> paying it, you know, st- sticking with us. What we're going to do now is move on to um, your quiz. The favorite part. The yeah, favorite riddle part. me this, riddle me that, as Jim Carrey would say. All right, so this would not be fun with films without, well, a bit of fun. But And we're going to ask you six questions, three each, about the work and the man that is Clint Eastwood. So we're going to start with you with question number one. All right, I've got to choose because I've got a few little options here. I think, right, question one, Clint Eastwood, yeah, one of his iconic characters was Dirty Harry. Um, What was Dirty Harry's Badge number. He was a San Francisco cop. And you see his badge at the end of the first film, I think it was, Dirty Harry. What was his badge number? Wow, that's one for real fans, isn't it? Mm. Okay. Uh, First question from me, question number two, is also about Dirty Harry, but I'm going to be kinder than Paul. I'm going (laughs) to ask you, how many Dirty Harry films have been made? (gasps) Right. And okay. you can get it also extra points if you can name the also the titles and the year. Uh, but how many? In fact, uh, Paul gave you the answer um, some some time ago during you know the recording of Fun with Films. Question number two. No three. googling. Number three from you. Number sorry. Number three, I think. Um, right. Um, the s- second boxing film to win an Oscar was Million Dollar Baby. What was the first? Okay. Thank you very much. If you've been paying attention, actually, Paul gave you the answer earlier today as well. So we know that Crime Macho, directed um, in 2021, is Clint Eastwood's latest you know, um, effort as a director. What was the title of his very first film as a director? Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that's going back. That's going Ooh. back indeed. Oh, oh, I'm not sure about that one. I got. Oh, question number that's five toughy. from you. All right, uh, my last one. Let's have a look. Right, he did a he did a film um, that I really really like, Escape from Alcatraz. Now, Escape from Alcatraz was it based on factual events or not? Is it a true story or a fictional story? Okay. To a false question. Final question from me. Clint Eastwood. Well, actually, if you remember when we looked at the little mini documentary from Warner Brothers, we saw a quick little um, excerpt from Steven Spielberg, one of my other filmmaking heroes. Well, would you know that Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg collaborated and were producers, co-producers of a film? What is the title of the film where Clint Eastwood and Steven Spielberg collaborated? That is a toughie. Mm. Okay, right. so, so six questions to give you a moment to think it through, but don't Google it. Just think it through and ask your friends and family and put, this. put the answers below. Watch this. There's one too many women in your Clyde is a clean ape. 
I'm gonna kick his ass out of here. If I was you, friend, I'd just sit right back there and I'd have myself another beer. You ain't me. Nope. I have another beer. Right. It's like Clyde's getting a little rowdy. Better get out of here. Bananas alone. Come on. <sighs> Kinda grows on you, doesn't he? There's gotta be a better way. <laughs> I mean, imagine being that actor faced with Clyde the orangutan sticking his, you know, his mush in your face mm. and then his finger up your nose. How he, how he didn't just run out of the door screaming, I don't know. I mean, I love those. Happily, films. those apes are very gentle because, I mean, they're so strong. They wouldn't. can be. Yeah, I wouldn't risk it. I don't, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want my nose pulled off by Clyde the ape. But actually, one of the things I meant to say earlier on, just before we finish with this, um, anyway, which book? can the black widows biker gang are hilarious and one of the the scenes i watched in preparation for this going back to kind of jog my memory on it is just so funny you've got john quaid the leader of the black widows they want to be so bad all crammed into this little living room Mm -hmm. and he's got this german kind of swastika flag behind him and he's standing there going we're gonna kill philo beto who are we going to kill? And they're all going, Philo, Beto, where are you going to kill? And one of them goes, <laughs> what's that? And the smoke billowing through this door. And he goes, oh, Lord, my muffins are burning. <laughs> and, it, you know, this hardened biker is baking muffins and he runs off to get his muffins. And fi- um, John, um, John Quaid Shola, the leader of the gang, goes, what did he just say? <laughs> He said his muffins were burning. Oh, Lord, Lord, why am I man made of shit? You know, and all the way through, he has his mannerisms that every time his men do something stupid, he's, mm. Lord, Lord, help me. You know, it's so funny. It's brilliant. And, and again, it was, it was the way in which comedy was crafted in, in, in those yeah. days. And I used to love these. You know, you could watch them. He mentioned Smokey and the Bandit and uh, all those were just all the same. It was so silly, but well done. Well done. That's that's why I was so good about it. So I hope you've enjoyed Questions. the quiz and the little fun scene with Clyde. <laughs> question number one and the answer, please, Paul. Oh, hang on. Hang on. My notes. What was question number one? It was Dirty Harry's badge number is 2211. Okay. You gotta be a fan. You gotta be a fan. Did you would you have getting that one? No, not no. at all. No. So do you remember how many Dirty Harry movies uh, have been produced? There's five. Five, yeah. yes. The last one being the Deadpool. Yep, there's Dirty and Harry, Sudden Impact, The Enforcer. Yeah. Deadpool. And the one you mentioned Ooh. earlier, Magnum Force. Magnum Force, that's it. Yeah. And I think for me, the Magnum Force is probably my favourite. Yeah. I mean, they're all great, you know, but... Um, I think Sudden Impact, did he direct that one? I think he, it's the mm-hmm. only one he's directed. Okay. Next question from you was? Ooh, I can't remember what the next one was. What was the next one? Oh, the second film. Yeah, Million Dollar Baby was the second film to win um, an Oscar or Best Picture. What was the first? Boxing movie. Boxing yeah. movie. So I'm I'm always torn between Rocky and um, Raging Bull, but I'm going to go for Rocky. It was. It yeah. was Rocky, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they're the only two kind of sports or boxing movies to have won. Mm. Next best picture, and I mean another one. You know, uh, Stallone. What a rags to riches story in its own right. Yeah, you know, ro- Rocky. It shouldn't um, have worked, <laughs> but it did. Yeah, absolutely. So I was asking you, Paul, and viewers and listeners, the very first movie directed by Clint Eastwood. Uh, I'd, I was tempted to say The Beguiled, but I think it might be Play Misty for me. Correct. Is it Play Misty for me? So here, here's the thing. Play Misty for me, which is, I, I really like it. Um, interestingly filmed in Carmel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Been ni- there. 1971. <laughs> Cry Macho, 2021. Can we, can we just take yep. a moment to stop here? 71, Play Misty for me, and Cry Macho, 2021. All right, your next question was? It, like you said, it could be 
done on purpose where this is his last project. Mm. We we don't know. Uh, right, what was the last one? Escape from Alcatraz. Um, is it a true story or a false story? I've, always, I've always believed it was a true story. It's based on factual events, but is highly dramatized. Okay, what does that mean then? It is <laughs> mostly true. We'll say we'll say it's mostly true. Yeah, it's based on true. Yeah. Um, my question was, Eastwood and Spielberg have had one collaboration. What is the title of the film? This, I don't know. I'm not sure. Really? I may know, but I don't think I know. Flag of I was, a Thousand. That's what I would have said. Yeah. Either that or, yeah. And, and it surprised me because we know that uh, Clint Eastwood has had this pretty much career-long relationship with Warner Brothers. He's worked with other distributors. Malpaso production has been part of it. But I remember when I put Flag of Our Fathers and then you see the the um, Dreams, or oh, what's the name of the company? It's not Dreamstone, but you know, it's it's um, DreamWorks. Yeah. yeah, DreamWorks. Thank you very much. Uh, I can. Oh, I went over, oh, and then I, when you look at yeah. the details, indeed, they they collaborated on that. So, yeah, absolutely amazing. Little thing, I haven't actually seen that or Iwo Jima. Right. I haven't seen them. I've got mm. I've got the box set, um, and I am saving it for. And I've got a few afternoons off over Christmas. I bet, yeah, yeah. Everyone, thank you so much Honorable for... Honourable mentions. Mm, well, so we're going to get to watching Fun With Films, this special Clint Eastwood uh, edition, much longer than we would normally, but please understand, we've tried to do justice to a career that is spanning seven decades. But there's going to be movies that we've not mentioned. We couldn't do it. We didn't have time. We couldn't quite fit it into the segments. So would you like to quickly mention some titles that are important to you? Um, I was going to say Kelly's Heroes in 1970 because mm -hmm. I, I, I find that so funny, but um, <laughs> Firefox in 1982, the story of a US pilot that has to go behind enemy lines or behind the Iron Curtain into Russia. It's kind of like an espionage story and steal this fighter plane, this MiG fighter plane that is almost sci-fi advanced in that you can control it with your mind. But the kicker is you have to be able to think in Russian, not just speak in Russian. You have to be able to think in Russian. Um, and it is a very different film for Eastwood, mm -hmm. and it was way ahead of its time. Um, but it's a great sci-fi stroke Cold War espionage movie that I, I loved as a kid. That's one. <clears throat> so... For me, um, Invictus was something that, uh, you know, yeah. again, time was against us, but uh, a very, very special one. We've mentioned, obviously, the, um, you know, the one that my father, Jean Fantoni, uh, has mentioned, yeah. La Route de Madison, Bridges of uh, Madison County, and Million Dollar Baby. So I'm sure you'll be very pleased you mentioned that. Um, one that um, I've enjoyed thoroughly going to the movies was The Rookie that you mentioned as well. Yeah, The Rookie. Um, again, one of the greatest Clint Eastwood lines when he sees these two <coughs> sports cars, Lamborghinis and Ferraris, and one's like luminous green and one's bright yellow. And he says, anybody that defaces a work of art like that wants his asshole removed. And that <laughs> just cracked me up. I thought it was hilarious. Um, City Heat. Yeah, of course, 1984, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the team up with Burt Reynolds, two of the biggest stars of their era, mm -hmm. where one plays a lieutenant, the other plays a private eye. They've got a team up on a murder. It's a little bit of a comedy film, but set in the 30s, so it's got that kind of vibe to it. And um, they hate each other. They were ex-partners, and they hate each other, so they've got to get over that animosity. And it's really quite funny, but it never really did very well, but... Yeah, I yeah. always loved it. Oh, uh, the same. Uh, <clears throat> two that are, are, again, time was against us. Blood work and true crime would have been uh, um, under the radar again. Yeah, massively. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. Have you got any others that we, should, um, we have time to mention? The Mule is brilliant. I love The Mule. Um, Pink Cadillac, 1989. Um, absolutely one of his more commercial kind of flops, as it were. It was never really well received. But it's funny. I think that was the last comedy he did, the last outright comedy. But I love the film. I think it's funny from start to finish. And I just think it's one of those films that um, a lot of people didn't give it a chance. Uh, but just going back as well to Every Way Which But Loose and Every Way Which But Can, they were his biggest commercial successes. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and the biggest opening weekend of any film, um, the first 
film to to open with ten million dollars weekend. I think in the biggest it of was his career. All about you know the tones right. The timing was impeccable. People wanted to be entertained and they wanted to see someone like him uh, just yeah. do something a, a bit different. One that I um, saw the movies again a long time ago and I need to watch it again is Bird. Yeah, and um, and and finally, just to kind of the list of things that once again time was against us: Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Ah, yeah, Jeff Bridges is brilliant in that, and I mean, he was just a kid, wasn't he? Yeah. When you watch it, man, like you know, he's an older guy now, and he was he was a child in Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. <laughs> There's so many we could go on. So, well, thank you. This was your idea, Paul, um, all those um, months ago when we had our you know, episode one debrief at the little restaurant in Durham, a Clint Eastwood special. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that you feel we've done justice to the work that is the legend um, of the world of cinema um, across those different segments. I hope you've enjoyed reminiscing like we've we've done about the many movies from the Frank of the 60s all the way to yeah. uh, only a few a few weeks ago. For future episodes of Fun with Films, please feel free to suggest uh, more specials. Do you have yeah, a, a, an actor? Sure. Do you have a director that you'd like us to kind of go through and tell you our personal stories about how we've grown with them and what we've done? So, yeah, thanks again, Paul, for choosing Clint Eastwood. Okay, guys, it's time, sadly, to draw down the final curtain and to put away our popcorn and leave the auditorium. Thank you. Thanks to Paz, and see you next time. from Denise it says right turn Clyde